Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's my honor to be here with you. My name is Tane Casserly, and I'm with NOAA's Monitor National Marine Sanctuary. And today we'll be talking about World War II on America's doorstep, U-boats off the mid-Atlantic coast. So I represent NOAA, which is the federal agency's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and we're part of the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. So Monitor is just one of 15 National Marine Sanctuaries and two National Marine Monuments in the National Marine Sanctuary system. And this system uh, encompasses more than 600,000 square miles of marine and Great Lakes waters from Washington State to the Florida Keys and from Lake Huron to an American Samoa. And we represent the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary, which is off the coast of North Carolina that you can see here with the arrow. Again, here's some other representations of our sanctuary, but we are located about 60 miles off the coast of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. And we're in 230 feet of water where the Labrador and the Gulf Stream currents collide. So not only is it a very challenging environment to work in, we've got one of the most important and significant shipwrecks in the world that we're interpreting. So we're very proud to be working to tell the story of the USS Monitor. So what was the USS Monitor? Well, it's a strange, basically, cheese box on a raft that was the Union Ironclad that was the first of its kind. It's a prototype, and it was designed specifically for sort of riverine and estuary harbor warfare to fight the CSS Virginia, which is the South, during the Civil War. You can see it is a strange-looking vessel, um, but if you think about if this is the days of cannonballs and cannon fire, that it was purposely very low to the water and not giving much for the enemy to, to hit, so you just had a little pilot house up forward, which is that little strange sort of square box by the bow that you see there to the right side. And then that rotating gun turret. And that rotating gun turret is the first working rotating gun turret in the history of the world. And that's the first uh, time this has been employed. And it's really the great, great grandfather of every modern naval gun on warships today. And here it is in the water next to its nemesis, the CSS Virginia, the, the ironclad that it fought that belonged to the uh, Confederate States Navy. And again, you can see how both vessels are very low lying to the water. Um, again, the, the, the Virginia, which is sort of in the background, has got sloping sides where cannonballs would bounce off. This was done on purpose. Very low lying to the water. And there's the monitor to the left of it. Um, again, much different profile. Strange looking vessel with that little rotating turret. Again, very low to the water. And these are the first time that these two types of vessels have come face to face in warfare. And this, of course, occurred very famously in Hampton Roads, which is here in the Chesapeake Bay um, between Newport News, Hampton, and Norfolk. And this is the Battle of the Ironclads, the first clash of the Ironclads, the first time these iron warships come head to head. So in less than eight hours on March 8th of 1862, the CSS Virginia attacked the entire Union fleet in Hampton Roads, sinking four vessels, capturing a transport, and damaging four other warships. The destruction left behind totaled 241 Union sailors killed and more than 100 wounded. It was the worst U.S. Navy defeat in Pearl Harbor. In contrast, the crew of Virginia suffered only two casualties and only a dozen wounded. So that evening of March 8th of 1862, the USS Monitor arrives in Hampton Roads after coming down from New York where it was built and encountered a scene of carnage and despair for the Union Navy. The Monitor then took up a protective position next to the grounded USS Minnesota, which is a steam frigate, um, wooden-sided, and Monitor's arrival buoyed the Union hopes for battle that was certain to come the next day. On March 9th of 1862, confident from the previous day's victory, the Virginia fired the opening salvo from a thousand yards out against the USS Minnesota, hitting the ship and causing an explosion. Tasked with protecting the Minnesota, the USS Monitor quickly moved to intercept the Virginia and for the next four hours, the two ironclads circled one another, trading shot and shell at point-blank range, but doing no significant damage. Each ship tried to ram the other. Each commander tried to find a weak spot. Through it all, the Minnesota remained afloat. Only an iron ship could stop in another iron ship. The battle that took place that day left neither the Monitor nor the Virginia seriously damaged, and both sides claimed victory. Ultimately, historians have called the battle a draw. But in fact, there was one clear winner, ironclad technology. The age of wooden warships was over. So sadly, the USS Monitor sinks with less than a year float. On December 29th, 1862, the Monitor was sent to join the blockading forces off North and South Carolina. It departs Hampton Roads in tow of the USS Rhode Island. You can see here in the image in the background, it's a side paddle wheeler, bound for Beaufort, North Carolina. On December 30th, of 1862, it encounters a storm off Cape Hatteras. On December 31st, 
the next night, Monitor battles to stay afloat as the storm worsens, and shortly after midnight that evening, Monitor goes down for the last time, with the loss of 16 officers and crew. Now, the vessel was discovered initially in 1974, and the announcement was made between Duke University and the U.S. Navy that they had discovered it. In 1975, it becomes our nation's very first National Marine Sanctuary. So you may have heard of Monitor um, from your days in high school from the Civil War. Maybe you're a Civil War historian or history buff. And maybe you remember in the early 2000s that we recovered major portions of the vessel, including that rotating gun turret, the first one in the history of the world, this this gigantic naval innovation, which is now undergoing conservation with our partner, the Mariners Museum and Park in Newport News, Virginia. But what this allowed us to do was now to look further afield of the Monitor shipwreck. And here it is just last year, what it looks like on the seafloor. But after all this work we've done on Monitor, the archaeology, the conservation, the artifact recoveries, the exhibits for the public, it allows us to look at the other shipwrecks that are surrounding Monitor off North Carolina. And there are literally thousands. And we're very excited to be telling these stories, one of which is World War II. And the story that we're telling through all of these shipwrecks here is really the story of America's rise as a superpower. And quite simply, it's the story of the United States. So the USS Monitor, for example, was the first turreted iron-hulled U.S. warship whose design changed naval warfare forever, and it signaled the U.S. transition to an industrial and technological giant and its ability to actually build this prototype vessel that changed the world. But Monitor is not the only shipwreck off Cape Hatteras. We also have battleships associated with General Air Marshal Billy Mitchell. And these battleships tell the story of America's introduction as a world naval power with Roosevelt's Great White Fleet, which they participated in around the world, and their sinking ushered in the transition from cap capital naval ships to the airplane and carrier warfare. So after their lifespan where they were in World War I, they were actually decommissioned and used as target vessels where Gen General Bill Mitchell used this new invented airplane, this new invention to drop bombs on these battleships to prove that his, his this small little mosquito could indeed sink um, some of the most powerful weapons of any nation afloat. So this is a huge transition now. We're moving from these battleships to carrier warfare. We also have World War I shipwrecks. And these stories and these wrecks help to tell the story of the U.S. pivot from isolation to a player on the world stage, just as we did going to Europe to help our allied forces. And of course, the most prominent collection of shipwrecks we'll be visiting today is from World War II's Battle of the Atlantic. These shipwrecks are the story of America's rise as the most dominant military and economic power in the world and the status that remains today. So what we have here, this is a naval battlefield of North Carolina, is where both World War I and World War II came home to America. It's where we suffered some of our greatest defeats and celebrated our first victories. And as we all very well know, it began in the United States at 7.55 a.m. on December 7th in 1941, when the Imperial Japanese Navy attacks Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. The military and civilian casualties total more than 3,400, including over 2,300 killed, with nearly half at 1,177 aboard the USS Arizona. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but it wasn't until four days later that the Axis powers, Italy and Germany, actually declared war against the United States. That happened on December 11th. And it was it's kind of a little known historical fact that even though the Germans and um, the Japanese were allies, they didn't necessarily show, share all the information together. So even though they knew the Japanese would be attacking the US at some point, they didn't know exactly when. So just like us, they were cut, uh, caught a little bit unawares hence a few days difference in the war declarations. And we really need to look at this map to understand what kind of war the United States entered. I mean, again, this isn't news to any of you, of course, watching this, but it was a global war. And it's amazing to see how the United States was able to project its military prowess in the far Pacific and the far Atlantic over into Europe and Africa, as well as Asia. It's, it's astounding. So, it literally shows how battles were fought, launched from the United States on literally the other side of the planet. It's the most complex event ever undertaken by the United States, and the sheer logistics to move personnel and material around the world is mind-boggling. Again, when we talk about the Battle of the Atlantic, take a good look at the shipping routes, because the Germans knew very well where that war material was coming from when it was coming over to Europe to attack them, and they needed to stop it. So, a month after Germany declares war in America, the first wave of five U-boats arrived off the U.S. East Coast. Known as Operation Drumbeat, this is the first of many operations 
that continued for months as German U-boats hunted merchant ships, which frequently sailed independently at night, making them easy targets in front of coastal city lights. At the start of the war, the U.S. Navy had too few destroyers and subchasers to patrol the coast while also escorting merchant ship convoys across the Atlantic, which had devastating consequences for American coastal shipping. And this shipping is what supplied those Atlantic convoys that were going to resupply the war effort in Europe. This coastal shipping was the lifeblood for the Allied forces. And Germany knew that by cutting that off, they could strangle the Allies into submission. And the reason why German U-boats focused so heavily on North Carolina was because of the continental shelf's proximity to land off the Outer Banks. And when we look at that continental shelf and how close it comes to the Outer Banks of North Carolina, this was the key point why there's such a high concentration of shipwrecks there. Because what the Germans would do would basically, in the daytime, hide in that deeper water just off the continental shelf where it was much more difficult to discover them. And then at night, in the cover of darkness, they would come closer into land go to those very well-known shipping lanes and attack those convoys quite easily. And these are the uh, an overlay in GIS maps of what those shipping lanes look like off Cape Hatteras. The same shipping lanes we have today is the same ones they had back in World War II and in World War I, by the way. So you can see exactly where these lanes are and they quite tighten up off that Outer Banks, North Carolina, where they make that turn sort of southwest to come down the eastern seaboard. And... When we overlay the known World War II shipwrecks over that shipping lanes, we can see where they exactly fall. And they're right in those lanes. So the Germans knew exactly where to hit us. They were very smart and able to prohibit the coastal shipping from getting needs to go to those main ports to come across the Atlantic. They wanted to stop it here at home first, and they did, especially in 1942. So during World War II, a total of 90 vessels were lost off North Carolina alone with most of these occurring during the first six months of the war. Of those vessels, 78 of those were merchant ships. Again, it's those cargo ships moving that war material, um, you know, the tanks, the guns, the bandages, ammunition, all those supplies, everything we needed. Those were the ones they wanted to stop, and they did. They also, uh, we lost eight Allied naval ships and four German U-boats, too, by the way. And of the 1,657 total World War II casualties off the coast of North Carolina, over 1,200 of these were merchant mariners. Historians have called this America's second Pearl Harbor, except the difference here is that the enemy wasn't attacking another naval force. The Germans weren't attacking trained warriors and scoring off against battleships or aircraft carriers. They were attacking merchant ships with civilian volunteer crews. The U.S. Merchant Marine provided the bulk of these sailors and many of these shipwrecks of North Carolina a graves for these brave men. During World War II, one in 26 merchant mariners died in the line of duty, suffering a greater percentage of war-related deaths than any other U.S. uniformed service. Now, North Carolina may have been where the Germans hit us hardest off the U.S. mainland, but it's also where we started pushing back. I think at the start of the war, when President Roosevelt said, history has, not, history has recorded who fired the first shot. In the long run, however, all that will matter is who fired the last shot. North Carolina is where that road began for the Atlantic War. This is where we had the first victories against the Germans, and think of the coastal defense of the East Coast like a trident, where all three prongs had their first successes against the U-boats off our shores. The first of these was April 14th of 1942, when the U-85 was sunk by the USS Roper off North Carolina, becoming the first U-boat sunk by the U.S. Navy off the American East Coast. The second was on May 9th, 1942, when the U-352 was sunk by the U.S. Coast Guard cutter Icarus, becoming the first U-boat sunk by the U.S. Coast Guard off the American East Coast. And here we have some of the survivors from the U-352 actually being taken um, for interrogation by the U.S. Navy and Coast Guard in Charleston, South Carolina. The third was on July 7th, 1942, when Lieutenant Harry Kane Jr., who's pointing in the image above, and his A-29 Hudson airplane sank the U-701 off North Carolina becoming the first U-boat sunk by the U.S. Army Air Force off the American East Coast. And thankfully, by May of 1943, the U-boats were no longer a major threat to Allied convoys. The now escorted coastal convoys, updated tactics by the U.S. Navy, and coastal blackouts going into effect, and the sheer volume of American shipping had now turned the tide against the U-boat threat. And I truly believe that these first successes that we had off the coast of North Carolina Pushing the U-boats back from our shores and all the way across the Atlantic made D-Day and the Allied invasion of Europe possible on June 6, 1944. 
If we hadn't had those first successes when we did in 1942, we would have never had the freedom to move the men and material necessary for one of the largest amphibious assaults in history in ending the war nearly a year later. Like Gettysburg and Antietam battlefields, we truly have a battlefield sitting off the coast of North Carolina. This naval battlefield is where two world wars came home to America. These shipwrecks are gravesites, they're memorials to heroes, and they're fragile reminders of our past, and they're also so much more. One of the things I really like to point out about these shipwrecks is that obviously the, the history is amazing. You know, the, the gravity of how these vessels are lost hits us hard. We want to tell these stories. We want to honor the history and heritage, honor our veterans. But we also look at it that now they've transitioned from weapons of war to o- oases of life, and they become habitat for marine life. I like to think as an archaeologist and a historian, everybody wants to focus on history. But of course, we all know that's not true, right? Some people love diving on shipwrecks and diving in general just to see marine life. And these shipwrecks, these U-boats, these allied anti-submarine vessels, you know, these merchant merchant ships, these gigantic merchant ships on the seafloor are just these beautiful homes now for all sorts of marine life. And we all know that when we go out to find shipwrecks, the fishermen obviously always know where these wrecks are. They're the first ones to know, oftentimes many, many years before we actually do, because that's where the fish are. So we want to tell that story too. And these vessels are really important for the coastal economies. You know, the, the, the charter fishing and diving industries are relying on these shipwrecks too to help bring, you know, sort of economic well being to their communities and for jobs. And this is really important. So when we're looking at this collection of vessels, and how people interact with them. We want people to dive on them, fish on them, enjoy them, but just show them respect and don't take any artifacts. But otherwise, they're there for the public good for us to enjoy and in myriad different ways, whether you are um, you just love to fish, you want to go after mahi-mahi or something of that nature, or you want to scuba dive. It's there for everybody for all the different uses. And, you know, we've had some challenges this past year, so we want to really get the word out in different ways. So one of the things we've done is work with our partners and especially the state of North Carolina and their Office of State Archaeology to have online webinars where we talk about stories just like we're telling today or some other things we're doing with our communities. You know, shipwrecks don't end at the water's edge. You know, we tell stories working with our state partners of how there's shipwrecks along the shore. Some of them are in the sand dunes and all other places, inland lakes. So we're just working with our partners to really tell all these stories to get that huge picture of what maritime history means for North Carolina and the Eastern Seaboard. And we invite all of you to join us on that that journey. We're also hopefully going to be able to doing a telepresence expedition where, which is actually taking you out to the public, out to our shipwrecks, working with a group called the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. And there's a web link right here. You can go to and take a look. But we're hoping to be able to work with members of the public, teachers, educators, researchers, all sorts of folks, and remotely bring these shipwreck tales to them with an ROV, which is a remotely operated vehicle, down on the seafloor, exploring the sites, and then we'll tour it with you and share it with the world over the internet. And here's just shows some of that technology, the working with our partners we bring to bear. Basically, you can see that ROV, which looks like that little robot on the seafloor, looking at the little um, coral on the bottom and that signal is bounced by satellite to you at home or you at the coffee shop or you out with friends at the beach. You know, you could watch that for free on your iPhone, on the computer, wherever you like. But it's some of those things that we really want to share with the public because this history is important to us as a nation that we remember these veterans and their sacrifices to us. And here's just a list of some of our partners too that we're very excited to work with. Um, local aquariums, museums, maritime museums, um, um, all sorts of folks. So we're very proud of that. As we look at these shipwrecks and their stories, it reminds me that as Americans, we're not born into greatness. We don't seek it out, but we do rise when greatness is thrust upon us. And this is our story. And our mission is that we never forget those sacrifices made by our veterans and all those that came before us. We are looking to expand our site, the Monitor National Sanctuary, to include these other shipwrecks and these other histories. So we'd invite you to come join our website at monitor.noaa.gov and help NOAA honor these battlefields. And also help to follow us on Facebook and Twitter, of course, to see everything that we're up to. 
And now that we've come to the end, I'll be more than happy to take any questions that you might have about the work we're doing off North Carolina to honor World War II and all our veterans. Thank you.